Welcome to another in the series of Ask to Be Watched Memorial Lunchtime Lectures. These lectures, ladies and gentlemen, have proven over time to be educational, enlightening, and indeed informative. This afternoon's lecture promises to be no different. But before we get into the the meat of the matter or the full-time lecture, we'll ask Brother Jeff Shepherd to invoke God's blessings on this afternoon's proceedings. Jeff? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Let's bow our heads in prayer for two minutes. Our God and Father, we thank you so much for bringing us here together today. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We praise the Lord for the showers of blessings we've given you sharing on the lands and the countries across the region. Thank you, Lord, for this party, Democratic Labour Party. We thank you, Lord, for the things that we have been able to fulfill for this country over the years. We pray, God, today that you will give better understanding to what is going to be spoken to you today. Thank you, Lord, for our speaker, Lord. We pray, God, you give him all the wisdom that he needs today to expound on what his topic is all about. Bless us all together, Lord, and for those who are in, um, uh, internet land, we pray God you bless you there as well as you watch. For all these things, we, Lord, we ask you to give us your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We, talk. we thank Comrade Jeff for invoking God's blessings. And at this time, we wish to extend the rain notwithstanding a warm and hearty welcome to all persons the other day indeed welcome dr harris we also acknowledge the president the presence of our president dr ronnie yearwood and our first vice president dr sorry mr steve blackett apologies dr harris is from my information well schooled in the art of accounting but to properly introduce him, I call on Miss Renette Demore to do that honor. Miss Demore. Good afternoon. Protocol has already been established. Today, the task of introducing our guests of honor and featured speaker comes with a great privilege. Dr. Terry Harris is an assistant professor in accounting at Durham University Business School in the United Kingdom. He received his bachelor's degree with a double major in computer science and accounting a Master of Philosophy in Phil in Computer Science from the University of the West Indies, Cafil Campus. He has also earned a professional accounting designation with, a association of, with the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants and a Doctor of Philosophy, PhD in Finance with Durham University. Dr. Harris has taught extensively in the disciplines of accounting, finance, business and data analysis and has engaged in several theoretical and applied research publications, both scholarly and professionally. In particular, he has engaged in collaborative research projects that aim at applying analytics, particularly textual analysis, NLP and machine learning to better understand firms economic outcomes and performance in healthcare in the healthcare sector in the United Kingdom. Dr. Harris is currently the director of the Ethical Finance Accountability Governance, the center at Durham University, and a founding member of Durham Rutgers Accounting Analysis Network. He has also reviewed four and published articles in the following academic journals. 
the British Journal of Management, European Journal of Operational Research, Accounting Forum, Finance Research, Letters Expert Systems, and several others. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dr. Terry Harris. Thank you for that very warm introduction, and thank you for everyone for coming. So my name is Terry Harris, and today the task has been given to me to present on the topic inflation and the rising cost of living, predominantly from a UK perspective where I live, and to draw implications for Barbados and the rest of the Caribbean. So with that in mind, the agenda for my talk today is as follows. First, I'll begin by giving a brief description as to what inflation is. I mean, we all know what it is. We're all feeling it in our um, pockets, but we'll firmly define it and further explain what is happening now, some of the reasons why economists believe that inflation is happening at this point in time. Then I'll want to relate it to the cost of living crisis that we're facing around the world, the UK, Barbados, and so on, and draw implications particularly for, for Barbados. So that's the agenda for today. So what is inflation? So as I'm sure you're all quite well aware, inflation simply refers to the rate at which currency is devaluing or it's losing its purchasing power really. So consequently, um, a general increase in the level of prices for goods and services, this is what inflation technically is, right? So inflation, just a general increase in the price levels for goods and services in the macro economy. Inflation can be classified into three main types. So there is demand pull inflation, cost push inflation and built-in inflation. And we're all facing a combination of these three types of inflation at this point in time. So demand pull inflation refers to a situation where increased demand is causing, well, for limited products and services in the macro economy, is causing the price levels, general price levels to increase. And of course, coming out of the pandemic experience, the lockdowns and so on, you'll find that individuals are going out there and they're engaging with their purchasing more goods and services, and this will tend to push prices upwards. So we're experiencing that at this point in time as well. Cost push inflation occurs in a situation where we, the costs associated with the production um, of the same set of goods and services, where these costs are accelerating. And of course, again, coming out of the pandemic, um, we've had the situation in the Ukraine has caused gas and energy prices to go up, and this is a major factor in production that's pushing prices, prices up. And then we have built-in inflation, a scenario or situation where because individuals expect that current levels of inflation will continue into the future, that's their expectation, if the cost of goods and services rises, they are going to want to negotiate for higher wages, higher profits, higher costs in order to maintain their living standards. And of course, this is a debate currently happening in Barbados. Individuals are agitating for higher uh, wages in particular, and of course, costs, profits, rents, and so on. And of course, this is also occurring very heavily now in the UK, where we're having industrial action as a result of this rising cost of living. So that's what inflation is. Like I said, we all know about it. Um, I'm not resident in Barbados permanently, but just this month I received a bill from Barbados Second Power for $500 in just to bill. And it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous at this point. I I need to transition to the photovoltaic system for sure. But yeah, so we are we're really faced with inflation. The cost of living is is getting higher and higher. So up next, I want to point to some of the reasons why we are faced with this increased level of inflation. Of course, again, we all well aware that the price of energy price of food, this is increasing around the globe. And there are some, some reasons that the economists have been pointing to. Of course, we don't have all of the factors and all the factors, but we do know some of them. So a significant factor that coming out of the pandemic experience is this demand pull factor that I've been talking about, where because individuals were locked up before, locked up uh, as a result of the pandemic, coming out of it, you're going out and you're buying more goods and services. And so there's increased consumer pent up demand that has been built up. Given the pandemic experience, individuals want to go out, they want to enjoy themselves, they want to go to fets, they want to go to bars and so on, and this would cause, um, this would push inflation. Also coming out of the pandemic experience, we've had an increase in um, supply chain disruptions, but predominantly out of China, 
we're they're still experiencing COVID um, outbreaks. So they're still experiencing COVID outbreaks. They have this zero COVID policy and they're locking down China. That's disrupting the supply chain. Of course, this is pushing, pushing inflation in our economy. And more recently, more disturbingly, and in fact, more tragically, is the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which is causing inflation around the world. And is this final tragic point that I like to point to next? So we have all these reasons. We have individuals coming out of the pan of the lockdowns associated with the pandemic, wanting to get out there and consume more. This is good. We have supply chain disruptions as a result of you know lockdowns and other issues in China predominantly, but other places as well. It's not so good. And then we have tragically the war in Ukraine, which is pushing up the price for particularly energy. Um, goods and services, well, energy goods, so gas and oil, but also with respect to grains, so fertilizer, well, grains and fertilizer. So as we're well aware by now, Russia, Belarusia and Ukraine are major producers and suppliers of these same set things, oil, gas, fertilizer. In fact, they're the major world suppliers for these things, upwards of 30% of supplies for gas, oil, fertilizer and wheat emanate from these three countries. And of course, there's been a outbreaking hostilities there. So that has caused the prices for these very necessary commodities to increase. Also, it should be pointed out at this point that Russia and Belarus in particular are also facing sanctions on exporting their goods and services. And this has served to structurally lock us into higher prices for these same said oil, gas, and so on that are produced by Russia and Belarus. So some of this thing is structural. These factors have resulted in an increased cost of production and hence significant cost push inflationary factors affecting the UK and affecting Barbados and the rest of the world. And so these factors in particular um, have resulted in what economists tend to term a negative supply shock. Right? So they've essentially moved the aggregate supply curve to the left. So it's this negative shock that increases inflation um, because we've had a significant increase in the cost of production. So turning my attention now to what's happening in UK, Britain at this present point in time is facing the highest rates of inflation since the 1980s. I was very happy to get out of the UK to come to Barbados, but things aren't that much better here, but they're definitely better than they are in the UK. With households in the UK, suffering the biggest hit income since modern records began. So things are really bad. Of course, Brexit isn't making life any better for those of us who reside in the UK. According to the Bank of England, UK point to point inflation hit 9.1% in just May as soaring food and energy prices continue to deepen the country's cost of living prices. What's more, the Bank of England is forecasting that come the autumn, come October in particular, there'll be double digit inflation. So we are expecting 11% inflation come the autumn, which is of course the onset of, um, nearing the onset of our winter tourist season. And this has negative implications for our close arrivals in Barbados because the UK, as you're all well aware, is a major source market for a country like Barbados, right? It's a major source market and they're facing tremendous inflation here, double digit. Furthermore, since April this year, Average gas and electricity prices in the UK have gone up by 53.5% and 95.5%. So that's average gas and electricity. Gas increasing by 53.5%, electricity by 95.5% in the UK. Now, gas, unlike in Barbados, in UK gas is quite important because not only do we use gas for cooking, but we use gas to heat our homes, right? So in the winter in particular, in the colder um, months, we need to heat our homes, and so gas is you know, fundamental um, expense, and it's, it's, it's gone up by 53.5%. More disturbingly, and more familiar with you guys, electricity prices have gone up by 95.5%. Um, I feel as though in Barbados has gone up quite a bit, but not by 95.5%. It's quite, quite, quite a lot. So energy bills are soaring in the UK. The cost of petrol is also increasing rapidly. And food, in, and food inflation is at a 13 year high, running at over 10%. So, food is inflating in the UK at over 10%. And like I said before, Brexit isn't making life any better there. So, Brexit is also perpetuating and escalating the cost of living, particularly as it relates to food. 
because most of the food imports come from Europe and Brexit is a friction that causes you know, food imports not to be as easy as it could be from the European Union, Europe in particular. So in response, the Conservative government in the UK has announced a raft of measures. They're spent billions of pounds in emergency financial support, but they're still facing heavy criticism over the cost of the crisis as millions of UK residents are struggling to cope with the galloping cost of living and we have stagnant wages. So we have stagnant wages in the UK and they're really struggling to cope with the cost of living crisis that is that's happening there. And it's this stagnant wage debate that's also happening in Barbados that I'm going to turn to next. So we have this stagnant wages, not keeping, in, not keeping up with inflation. Of course, um, individuals are going to reasonably ask for higher, higher wages in response. So like in Barbados, Wages, particularly those in the public sector in the UK, wages in the public sector have remained stuck. They're stagnant, they've not kept pace with inflation, and there has been industrial unrest. So, of course, against the backdrop of high inflation and falling standards of living, arguments over wages and pay are going to be inevitable. Individuals are going to demand more wages, more pay is going to be an axe for higher rents and so on. So in fact, just this month, the railway workers, which I'm sure you guys would appear to be reported, took three days national strike, and it was the biggest walkout since 1989. I said this month, but I meant June, right? So since last month, they, they walked out, and it's the biggest industrial action by the railway workers since 1989. So as unions are demanding a better pay deal, and they want some guarantees over job cuts. So the Conservative government in the UK is threatening to um, jobs, and they're also threatening um, that they will not increase workers' wages commensurate with inflation, and this has caused the industrial action. Similarly, national health care workers, NHS workers in England, are also bracing for a sub-inflation pay deal, and are also expected to take industrial action as a result. Workers across the economy, in fact, have good reasons to be angry because according to the UK Office for National Statistics, this suggests that despite increases in the nominal wage rate of 4.2%, so nominal wages are people's actual like, monetary wage, this has gone up by 4.2% between February and April, real wages actually fell by 2.2% compared to 12 months ago when you take inflation into account. So real wages, wages adjusted for inflation in UK fell by 2.2%. Workers are not very happy about this and are likely to take further industrial action. So we've had action by the railway workers. Of course, if the railways in England are shut down, you're not going anywhere anytime soon. National Health Care Service workers are also threatening. Recently reported that the lawyers are also threatening to take industrial action. So this is a major problem. So, so far, the UK government has warned that bigger wage deals could threaten a 1970s style wage price spiral. So we've been here before. We've had supply shocks in the past. We passed supply shots in the 1970s, um, early 1980s, and you know, increasing wages has resulted resulted at that point in time in uh, this wage cost spiral as inflation increases uh, as a result of wages being increased. And so they're arguing that this would further push wages, further push inflation further, which is not good for the economy because ultimately we may have to increase interest rates, which may not be good for pensioners, and so on and so forth. So many have argued that this is not necessarily going to happen in the UK if increased productivity levels accompanied by increased wages um, occur in the economy. And this is also a debate that's happening here. So we have this increased cost of living, individuals are agitating for higher wages, and then there's the, there's the call for, OK, well, in order to get these higher wages, we need to increase productivity. This is also a pure point that's happening here as well. So what are the implications for our Barbados? Well, first of all, the cost of living crisis in UK is likely to result, or it could result, in lower cost arrivals from that market come the autumn, as UK residents have lower disposable income. So this is something we need to pay attention to. We may need to take further action to advertise in those markets to ensure that we still get the, the demand for our um, tourism services come the winter season. So further, energy prices are likely to spike unless we're able to get um, the war in Ukraine under control, which I don't suspect will happen anytime soon. So energy prices are likely to continue to rise, and this will 
affect transportation into Barbados, particularly airline travel into Barbados. I don't know if you've any of you traveled recently, but I have, and the cost of travel into Barbados is very expensive at this point, and particularly from the UK. And so if we are unable, and we're not talking about taxes, but of course those are ridiculous on um, airline tickets as well, but just the ticket itself is really expensive as a function of the um, energy costs. So this is likely to also put downward pressure on tourist arrivals in Barbados. In addition, in Barbados itself, Barbados itself is also experiencing elevated levels of inflation with the Barbados Central Bank reporting inflation at March at about 4.2%, while other sources such as the IMF are reporting even higher levels for the same period. As this figure is expected to rise, there could be increased calls for wages to be increased as in an effort for wages to be chasing the cost of living in an effort, again, to maintain individual standard of living. So to be clear, it is my view that the social implications of not increasing wages need to be seriously considered in what is already a high cost of living environment. So this is obviously already a high cost of living environment, as you know. And so the, the suggestion that we just dismiss individuals' requests for higher wages, we need to um, question that a little bit. So while we can agree that to avoid pushing inflation higher, it will be necessary and ideal for wages to be accompanied by productivity gains, we need to also point out that productivity is not only a function of workers' work ethic, but also the management practices, education levels, technology, and capital that they have to work with. So workers alone should not be the brunt of this. Um, there are a lot of factors that enter into productivity, not just workers' work ethic. So therefore, if policy is directed at improving these things, we can avoid, I would argue, the dreaded wage price spiral while responding to workers' reasonable wage increase demands. And as I said, reasonable. Of course, we can't get ridiculous about it, but we shouldn't just dismiss um, workers asking for increased wages at this point in time. Of course, we need to be prudent, but you know, we shouldn't dismiss the ads. In the absence of doing so, economic theory would suggest that we are likely to see a diminution in workers' real and if not nominal wages, lower standards of living. And speaking as a worker myself, because maybe all of you think we're in the working class, I'm not sorry, that many middle class, you know, but we're already workers, to be honest with you. And speaking as a worker myself, and to put a twist on the famous quote by Keynes, in the short run, if this was allowed to be happening in Barbados, we'd all be broke soon, right? So we heard that, you know, the middle classes are being asked to pay more and more, but there's a lot of pressure being put on the middle class, and if this is not checked, the middle class will soon broke if they're not broke already. So, just to wrap up, we're seeing increased levels of inflation, and the cost of living crisis across the world is affecting not only the UK, but Barbados as well. This is particularly the case in the UK where, unfortunately, electricity costs have doubled. So we have doubling any cost of electricity in the UK. Thank God that's not happened here yet. Please install solar voltaic uh, panels on your houses, homes as soon as possible. And we're facing double digit inflation rates come the autumn in the UK. This has implications for Barbados again, as individuals in the UK will have less disposable income. And so we need to pay attention to this because come our winter season, I know we are projecting to have a bumper season, but that may not materialize. The UK is a major source market for Barbados. And if they don't have a lot of disposable income, they're not gonna come. So this is something we need to pay attention to come the autumn well, and the winter. So further Barbadians are facing increased cost of living and while calls for raised restraint at this point in time makes sense in the absence of productivity gains, the social implications of such an already high cost of living environment needs to be seriously considered by our policymakers and should not just be dismissed. And so we should expend all efforts to cater to workers' reasonable wage demands. These efforts may mean that we take a look at the other factors that will break productivity in addition to workers' work ethic. All right, so at this point, that's it for me. I'd like to take any questions because I'm told that we have um, opportunity for questions and then, and then we'll have it. Again. Any questions? Yeah, the lawyers, yes. Government lawyers, government solicitors. 
<laughs> well, there, in the UK, um, if you're unable to afford a lawyer, there is um, support that is given to you, so you, you're able to get government funding to get a lawyer, and that fund has not increased in a number of years. So the lawyers who participate in that fund are threatening not to provide um, legal services to individuals, yeah, legal aid is what's called, yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, unfortunately, in the case of Barbados, a lot of the cost that we're experiencing is imported, right? So apart from government reducing maybe the tax take on things like energy, which I noticed that they've done, um, there isn't a lot that we can do with respect to a lot of the inflation that we're importing. Um, so this is a, this is a serious matter, um, but with respect to the cost of living, there isn't a whole lot I can see apart from reducing taxes on things like fuel. Um, which they have, they have started to do, but maybe they can do more of that. I have not analyzed the constant worrying of the government to be able to make a comment on that, but um, I will say this. If you're borrowing for productive purposes, and if you're borrowing at very low interest rates, then that makes sense, once so long as you are able to grow the economy. If you're borrowing simply to spend on recurring expenditure, then that's never going to be good, irrespective of the, of the interest rates that you're borrowing at. So insofar as we borrow, I, I know um, Barbies has done a lot of borrowing recently, um, but insofar as, as the country is borrowing at low interest rates, I'm putting these borrowings to productive, and this is the important point, productive uses, then we don't have a problem with that as long as we're able to grow the economy. However, if borrowing is targeted at recurring expenditure, irrespective of the interest rate that's being applied to the borrowing, um, there's opportunity costs associated with that and it should be avoided. So we need to be careful what we're borrowing for. It's the point of If you're borrowing for infrastructure, that's going to be that's going to expand the economy. This is good, right? And if you're borrowing at lower interest rates, that's even better. We don't want to borrow at high interest rates. Um, but if you're borrowing to pay government salaries and these type of things, um, irrespective of the rate at which we borrow is not very good. Thank you. <laughs> well, I don't know that I would save printing money. <laughs> I don't know that I would start there. Uh, but um, I'll just take the question uh, as, as we give it, as, as how you give it in, right? So what are the factors that are causing inflation in Barbados? Barbados um, is import, we import a lot, right, in Barbados. And so a lot of the, given that there's this, this shock to energy prices around the world, everything has to be, you know Barbados is in basically the Atlantic, right? Everything has to be shaped here, and that's driving a lot of the inflation that we're, that we're seeing. Maybe there could be government policies that are driving it. Maybe that's what you're trying to get at. Um, but I'm not. I'm not aware of any, apart from maybe the taxes on energy that maybe could be reduced or cap, which they've done. That. I didn't say. I know you were the person that introduced printing money. I never said not printing money. I could never comment on something. Thank you.